name is Kristen Spanchenberg, and I am here with TV writer and screenwriter Steve Kunis. And this is for the Writers Guild Foundation and TV Academy, the people that bring you the Emmys. So I'm so so excited to be here with you and, and talk about your life and all your achievements as a writer. Well, I, and I, I agree with you. There's nothing more <laughs> exciting than my life. Yes. Yes. And I know you've had so many years. How many years have you been? 41 years. 41 years in total, which is a long time to be in the industry. This morning, my sister texted me and I told her what I was doing you know, for the union. And uh, she said, why would they ask you to, <laughs> to do it? Well, gee, I've been like a writer for four decades. And she goes, yeah, but that's just like something you do. That's I, such I, a sisterly thing to say, like it's, uh, yeah, sibling competition so. there. <laughs> I said, thanks for the encouragement. I'm, I'm, I'm heading toward the studio right now. But, but no, I'm, I'm glad to be asked to do this. Uh, I've seen a number of uh, interviews with writers, most of whom are not even here anymore, but they were the people that I was inspired by. And it's, it's, it's really an honor to be to be among them i hope i don't end up dead but you know no 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 over my dead body yet we'll get to that later (laughs) um so i just wanted you to introduce yourself tell us a little bit about what you've done what notable things you have worked on well um, well i i started in i started at the top but it took me uh, quite a while to do that Before, before i tell you I just want to let you know I'm from Philadelphia. This is originally being brought, broadcast on Philly Cam and being recorded at the Philly Cam, which is Philadelphia Community Access Media uh, in downtown Philly, obviously. And uh, I'm from this area, and I grew up in Levittown. Levittown is like the, if you've ever seen the show The Wonder Years. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what, what it is. And uh, I would watch TV. I had an old TV that my parents put in my room that had the doors. It's a cabinet. And you open the doors and, you know, black and white TV. And uh, that got me hooked as a kid. Uh, I, I watched the old Lucy shows, the Honeymooners, and I became fascinated with this uh, this idea that people were in some foreign town, usually at, back then it was New York. And um, I go, and then it was being brought to me through, and I, you know, we would have a little rotor adjustment on the antenna and, and you know, everything was done through the, through the, get the static out of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was a major event to get a television station to get any type, you know, I, I, it was really a way for me, I think, to leave my town. Not that my town sucked, it's yeah. just that, but everybody's town kind of, they think there's got to be more than just their town. Right. So people in California want to move to New York. You know, people in Ohio want to move to San Francisco, whatever it is. And so I, I, I saw this as a far off land, uh, whatever I was watching and whatever, you know, I think that that is pretty common among most of the people I've met in the entertainment industry. And so... I became fascinated with the names on the screen and, and the names, you know, that they would, they would go by pretty fast and I would do my best to try to memorize them. When, when, when most people, they change the channel, Mm -hmm. but but not me. And I, I would go, these must be the people that worked on, on this thing. I wonder who they are and where they came from. And I wonder if they're, they're like me, like, is there anybody from, you know, where I grew up. Yeah. Um, so you wanted to know more about, you, you, you figured out that there was more than just the actors on the screen, that there was, you know, sound people, I saw, screenwriters, I saw everything. I things like uh, key grip. I had no idea what that was. Yeah. Or, or the craft services. I don't know what kind of craft. I thought it was arts and crafts. Yeah. I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that it was the food, you know, the food truck that, you know, the assistant sound editor, the Foley artist. Like, oh, like, what is this? I mean, don't people just show up in front of a camera and, and make it up? Mm-hmm. 
and I became fascinated with uh, and the, and the writers. I go, so this is this is all written, and I I uh, ne- never met anybody like me until I went to Hollywood when I was twenty six, and then everybody was like me. I go, yeah, <laughs> Surprise! Yeah, I'm from I'm from Michigan. I'm from Florida. What I used to watch the names on the credits, and mm-hmm. and, and, and they, you know we would exchange like a trivia pursuit game. Who could remember who the cameraman on Casablanca was? Was Arthur Edison? Who knows that? Except people that are just, you know, that that was my thing. Mm-hmm. So, some people memorize sports scores or, <laughs> or, or capitals of, of every state, like my mother does. But but uh, but for me, it was the people that, you know, I, I, I don't know what what caused that. And the reason I bring this up at the beginning of the interview yeah. is because you'll see how this applies later. Um, but in, in answer to your question, I um, decided that I wanted to learn more about um, television and film production. So I said, well, where do they make this? Well, it's in California. Well, I can't go there. You know, I'm so far away. And a friend of mine, uh, a neighbor of mine said, well, why don't you go to New York? Go to college in New York, yeah. Because uh, you'll be around that, and you know, and that's exactly how I chose my college. It had nothing to do with like what what the teachers or the major or right, the reputation. Right. I just said, where am I going to go? Well, there's only two real colleges I could think of: is NYU and Columbia. And I went up to Columbia, and I said, oh, this is kind of dangerous up here. I think I'm <laughs> so. I chose NYU, which was in Greenwich Village, mm-hmm. and I I studied literature, which is incredibly practical. Yeah, uh, you know, from literature to lit- literature like plays. guarantees you no job. Yeah, <laughs> unless you want to work in a bookstore, which right. is not a bad job. Um, and I I did that, and I started writing short stories, and I started meeting the people that would lecture at the college. We had Kurt Vonnegut come by. Mm. And Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch Twenty Two, and yeah. and uh, 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 Norman Mailer, a number of, and although the three of them lived in New York, Kurt Vonnegut was from Indiana, and he said the same thing. He said, "You go to the, you end up wanting to go to the far off land." Yeah, he said, and in, and in my case, the far off land was only an hour's train ride away, so I lived there for eight years. And after, you know, after I graduated, uh, it didn't take eight years to graduate. It's not like Animal House. <laughs> and and uh, I said, what, you know, to my professor, well, what do I do to, you know, I, I've been writing a lot. I've written some scripts. I wrote a spec script for MASH and one for Taxi, to because they were my favorite shows mm-hmm. at, the t- at the time. Uh, and I go, how... You know, what should I do? And uh, my professor said, well, why don't you look at the, you know, you know all the names. He said, why don't you look at the names of who produces the show and write them a letter or, or write a letter to the head of the network? Right. And I go, what do you, he said, nobody does that. He, wow. he said, no, because everybody would think that's the most outrageous, ridiculous thing that you could ever do. Right. Yeah. So. Just make sure you tell them why you're writing to them specifically. Don't just write, you know, find out what they've done, find out about them, and um, and write a one-page letter, and don't even talk too much about you. Talk, talk about them mm-hmm. and, and, and what, you know, why you would like to work for them and what you're doing now. And uh, so I did that. I wrote to Aaron Spelling. I wrote to Grant Tinker, who was uh, the head of the chairman of NBC. I wrote to um, Steve Cannell, that did the Rockford Files. I wrote to Norman Lear, uh, who was the single biggest producer, still is in the history of television for comedy, and mm-hmm. he's alive today at 101. Yes. And uh, I probably wrote about 14 letters. I wrote to my favorite writer, William Goldman, a screenwriter. He lived in New York. So every single person got back to me. Wow. Was that like a real shock to you? Every like, single surprise? person. Surprise? 
uh, Grant Tinker, the chairman of NBC, said, uh, you know, you, he told me, you have to come out to L.A. You got to knock on a lot of doors. Um, he said, but, but your letter is sincere. He goes, you're going you're, you're gonna to do well. And I met him, you know, you know, a few years later. But Norman Lear uh, did more than that. He said, "Can you send some? Do you have samples? Hmm. You know, nobody wants to read your script. They always say, if you want to get a person out of your life, give him your screenplay. <laughs> you'll, you'll never hear from him again. It's like you will never. You know, that works to this day. If you just don't like somebody, you just give them like, oh, here's a book I wrote. You know, right, like, right. Yeah, just read this, it. or and then and then uh, I did I did that uh, at the time." I had gotten married, and my wife was seven months pregnant. And uh, I, anyway, I heard f- from Norman Lear, and Norman Lear said, "If you if you come to L.A., let me know. I'll meet with you. In the meantime, um, I'm having people at my company, you know, read read this material." So my son was due to be born in May of 1983, mm-hmm. and it's now March. So, you know, I, I charged them my credit card money. I, I, you know, just didn't have. My wife came with me, this big pregnant wife. And we went out there and uh, I called. And the secretary didn't know me, obviously. You know, so she said, oh, well, he, we're not hiring or whatever. I said, no, Norman told me. Oh, Norman told you? Okay, well, nobody had read my scripts yet. I said, well, I'm here. I'm going to leave uh, Wednesday, you know, which like a couple of days later. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had those scripts read. The next thing I, I get a call uh, from him. Can you meet Can you meet Norman at 3 o'clock today? I, and my plane was 10 o'clock at oh night. My, gosh. my pregnant wife is Stressful. with me. She's sitting in the lobby. And uh, I'm told to this day, this is one of the all-time great How I Got In stories. Yeah. And, it, and, it really, and I've heard some good ones. I bet. <laughs> but, but I go in there. Apparently, uh, they like my scripts. I don't know how good. They, how You know, it's a mash and a taxi. Oh, by the way, I could never get a job on mash and taxi because I chose the two shows that happened to be canceled the same year that I wrote this. So it was like oh. there was no more. And and he told me, I, I I said I I heard that you, you know, or you know, or from New Haven, and 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 there was a story about Norman's father, and who who called up Sid Caesar and said you had to hire my son and all, and somehow he got the guy on the phone and he he badgered him and that and got his son in, and that's how Norman started. Okay. Um, and uh, Norman hired me he said okay i'll tell you what i'll do when your when your son is born it was going to be a boy when your son is born um just wait you know it could be in may he said i will pay for you to move out here wow he said you'll need money in the meantime and he wrote me a check for five thousand dollars and he said if you come to work for me this is a bonus and um, but if not, you pay it back. Like like I'm gonna change my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, Norman, I Norman Lear. In, I want to work in a hardware store. So <laughs> my wife's sitting in the lobby. They bring her in. He hugs my wife. Uh, you know. And the next thing, I fly back and I go, I can't believe that just happened. My professor said, right. I thought my professor was crazy. Yeah. And I said, right. You know, do this. So he he brings me out a couple. Oh, he also says, you know, I have three daughters, and uh, I, you know, we always wanted a son. I never knew what to name the daughters, but the son I was going to name him Adam, you know. So we named our son Nathaniel Adam. Oh my after, gosh! After after uh, that, very and then fitting. Some years later, Norman had a boy. He got he married again, had had a boy, and he named him Benjamin. I'm going like. Norman. So, <laughs> so uh, there I am. I have an office on, at 26 years old on the Universal lot. And what Norman did was he hired um, young people. I wasn't the only one he did this to. He, 
He made it up. There were three other writers. Same thing. Gave them five thousand dollars. Got them set. But they were in California. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And and he believed he was the only one. I just lucked out who I wrote to. He believed in hiring young people, um, and he would put them together with old people that had worked in television forever. People that worked on uh, the old Lucy show, the two mm-hmm. two writers, uh, Andy and Mayberry, um, My Three Sons. And they were like in their 60s and 70s. Nobody wanted them anymore. They're too old. And, mm. and he would put this, them together with us. And and it was like on the job training from the best writers, at, yeah. like, you know, multiple Emmy Award winners. And I think I learned more in a few months than I could at a film school. Yeah, I so, bet you did. Wow. Um, so I worked for Norman for two years. And... Uh, and then he sold this company and retired, but that launched me. And the kicker is, when I would go on the set, somebody like one guy, the first guy was a stage manager, Ted Baker, and I, that's one of the names I would watch and I'd see and keep track of on my- On the credits? Uh, on, yeah. on the credits. Um, and and I, I, you know, Mark Hirschfeld, a casting guy, oh, I see you cast this and this. You know, and he said, oh, nobody pays attention. I said, I paid attention to that. I said, I watched you. And the bookend to the story, uh, or at least this first part, is when I went back to Pennsylvania with, uh, you know, to visit my, my family a couple times a year. Some t- one time, uh, Chris, it was a couple days before Christmas, we were watching an episode of Kate and Allie. And I saw my name on on the same TV screen that I used to sit in my room, and, and uh, I go now my name I, like. Yeah, now you're just like wow, my name is on TV. Like the it's like 360. It's right. come around. It was really, you know, so that's one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, and, and document for the for the guild because yeah. it's the number one thing that I get asked. Almost every day of my life up until today, and I'm 67 years old, how do you get in? Mm-hmm. And, and my, you know, my advice is to do, well, they say knock on doors. It's hard to knock on doors these days. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got cameras. Yeah. Like, nobody's going to let you in. Yeah. Like security. <laughs> hey, you know, but get in. No. <laughs> don't send an email. Don't send a text. Mm-hmm. You write a very a personal letter, and the ver- and the first paragraph is um, why you're writing to them. Why why did you choose them? Mm-hmm. Not like you're on a list of uh, okay, I I uh, you know I want to write half hour comedy, so I'm going to write to everybody that produces. No. Yeah. Do you watch all their shows? Do you really care? What 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 is it about their work that strikes you, and why? You know, you're making a decision what you want to do with your life, and you're aware that it's not an easy life. A lot of times, you, it's you're unemployed, mm-hmm. uh, or the show gets can- you love what you're doing, and something the show gets canceled. Yeah, you can't control uh, it. Or they, or or you're just about to shoot something, and they fire the head five people at the studio, and so they flush all the projects they have in development, sometimes out of spite for the guy before them, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, so what, you know, what is it that, uh, that, that's, that's the main thing. What is it that you have, um, an affinity for about, about them? Uh huh. So. That's how you start the letter. And then you can add in some more information about a little bit about yourself or more so about, about yourself, them. Yeah. what you would like to do. And you're just asking them to meet and say at the worst, worst comes to worst. I get to meet one, one of my idols. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I had a hundred percent success rate on that. That's so amazing. So wow. So that's that's something you would recommend somebody trying to get into the business to do, right? Nowadays too. So that and 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 I just and write every day if you're a writer, if you're an actor. You know, you know Tony Bennett had a voice coach his whole life. So did Barbara Streisand. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, I have a natural gift. I can just do this. Yeah. It's like, no, you, you, you really, you, you, there's always more to learn. And um, you, have, you have to be persistent about it. 
And it's easy to get discouraged because a lot of times you don't get support from, like, my, my sister sending me a text today. Like, hey, what? <laughs> Why, why do they want to interview you? Like, that's a nice thing to hear 20 minutes before I sit down in front of this mic. Yeah, no. You know, my own sister. So I hope she watches this. <laughs> She's going to be like, how dare doesn't... you talk about me on there? Right. <laughs> so um, so I did that. The, the very first thing I wrote for Norman was called A.K.A. Pablo about a Mexican-American family. And... Uh, he thought it was the greatest show in the world. And um, according to TV Guide, uh, first thing I wrote, is listed at number 45 among the worst shows in TV history. That's amazing. That's how I, <laughs> that's what I got out of that. Okay, uh, two, years, two years later, I wrote A Love Boat, which is here, and uh, TV Guide listed it at number 82, among the greatest episodes of all time. Guess and they changed their mind, huh? And I look, <laughs> I look at the scripts, I go, they're really not that much different. Like, how, how is one, you know, one would, one would make anybody quit the business. And, this, and the second one um, would kind of go to your head. But I know that the love boat wasn't, wasn't the greatest thing in, in TV history. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's... And, and also, somehow, I, I've done this for 40 years. I don't know how that went by so fast. I'm on Facebook with a lot of the producers I worked with over the years, and they um, say the same thing. They go, like, I just remember back in the 80s and 90s, we were doing this, and now we're, like, all old. But Yeah, and you, you wrote for some uh, TV as well um, with the... Uh, Johnny Carson, and right. Tell well, us a little bit about your well, experience with that. Uh, I had an agent that said, because you know, I I said I, I would always say to him, his name was Mitch Mitch Stein. He, um, I said, you know, I come up with like ten jokes I think are pretty good every single day of my life. I should write for the Tonight Show, and he said, well, if you write for the Tonight Show, uh, people will peg you as that kind of like a gag a joke writer mm -hmm. and not a script writer and that would detract from your career at the time i wasn't working a guy said i have no career what do you mean? <laughs> like it's not detract me from what and uh he tried to talk me out of it i said well just just see if i can get in and i wrote some material and they sent it to a, a guy named ray siller who was the head writer I got a call like three hours later. I guess he just ready to go, oh, this is, you know, the monologue jokes that Johnny Carson wanted. Um, he said he didn't want them too funny because people would get used to this huge, um, you, know, you know, this expectation. It's got to be hilarious. Yeah, every single said, episode. Yeah. He said also it's, it's like the middle of the night, so people just want to smile. They don't want to. And um, so I don't know if he was telling me that my jokes weren't that funny or... or <laughs> A backhanded compliment, yeah, maybe, like, or... Like, oh, gee, you're a mediocre guy. You're just <laughs> what we're looking for, you, you know. But um, I ended up doing that for four and a half years. And, and the th it was my favorite job I've ever had because, really? you know, it, it, the, the satisfaction during the day... It was, you know, you, you, you write a joke in the morning... They they recorded at five thirty that night, and eleven thirty that night. You know, twenty seven million people see it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I did that all the way up until the very last. I wrote the very last joke that Johnny Carson did in over forty five hundred wow. shows, which was. Yeah, I was gonna say, can you tell us what it was? Well, you have to remember who Lorena Bobbitt was. Okay, I don't. Know <laughs> I'll look it up later. Okay. Well, <laughs> Lorena, God, I could say this. All right, so she got in a, a woman that got in, my director knows who Lorena Bobbitt is, I'm sure. But Lorena Bobbitt um, lived on Long Island and she was married um, to this guy that she found cheating on her. So she cut off his penis. Okay. 
okay? She threw it like in the woods. The police found it, and they somehow sewed it back on. Wait, I know this. Okay. Uh, now I'm remembering the story. <laughs> so she goes, now tell me, oh, so that, I mean, we milk that. Yes. For about a month and a half. Yes. So, but the last joke, she went on a trial finally for it. And my joke was, Lorena Bobbitt went on trial today, and the bailiff said, Mrs. Bobbitt, please raise your right hand and keep the other one where I can see it. That was, that was <laughs> oh the last gosh. joke. That's great. That is, I made some notes for this interview because... Yeah, there's, there's a lot that you've done. Not, I don't know how actors can uh, memorize a whole play. It takes a lot of... I can't even memorize work. my own life. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I did... Yeah, well, you've done so much... You know, I think I hit up hit upon a lot of stuff. Oh, we used to write twenty four jokes every day in the monologue. They still do that on all the shows. Okay, similar. So okay. that is good, and I do have the secret for anybody out there that wants to write comedy because that's kind of what yes. I know. Yes, everyone wants to hear that secret. And it's a great secret, and and it was shared to me by a man named David Lloyd that wrote most of the uh, Mary Tyler Moore episodes. Way and Cheers. And Frasier. Great shows. And All great shows. <laughs> he said he said that um, movies are visual. He said, so you should be able to turn down the sound on any movie and just watch it silently and completely understand it. Hmm. He, he said, but television is the, the opposite. Television is really like a radio play. And so he said, don't get distracted in some actors on like in, in a kitchen, like the Cosby show or something. He said, what you do for that is you turn the picture off and you just listen to it. And back when he told me this, they had Sony Walkmans. This was before digital everything. And he said, if you want to write for a show, and I say this to anybody watching this. Yeah. This is the single, you don't have to go to film school. Just, just do this one thing. Make a tape or, or an audio recording of a show or a few episodes of the show you want to write for and listen to it about 500 times. Yes. And, and when you hear that, he said, you'll be able to write like Seinfeld episode. They could be, you know, ordering dinner and it'll sound just like Seinfeld because it's in your mind how the characters sound. Mm -hmm. He said, but if you watch the show, you're not just listening, you're watching. So when you write something, you think in your own mind that it sounds like uh, Seinfeld or Kramer or George but, or uh, Elaine or whatever. Yes, but to another reader, it sounds the same. And Norman Lear told me that too. I said, what did you think about my scripts? That he said, your, your dialogue. He said, you have a lot to learn about story construction. He goes, but we can teach you that. But you cannot teach a person how to write dialogue or jokes. Like you're funny or you're not funny. Yeah. You're right. But as far as beginning, middle, end, um, he goes, that, that can be taught. You just study scripts, you know, over, over time and you'll, you'll get really good at a catchy opening or, you know, an act break. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, David Lloyd told me, he said, he said, just do that. And I had, I had met him. Uh, he was one of the people he came to lecture at NYU. And that's what I did for the taxi and the mash. I had a Walkman at the time, a Sony Walkman with a little cassette. And I would walk around Central Park, you know, just listening to the same episode and uh, I had the, I had people that had worked on Mash, later. I, they said, again, how did you get in? What did you use? Oh, I wrote a Mash. Really? Let me see it. And this is a guy who produced Mash. Yeah. Or one of them. And he goes, this is this is great. This sounds just like, oh my god, yeah, you know. And I told him how I did it, and he said, oh, I never thought about that. Like. It's not, it's something so obvious, but you wouldn't think yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would think of that. I'm not a writer, but like, I feel like that is really helpful for people that are trying to get into this. Yeah, if you're yeah. looking to write a pilot, uh, an original characters, that's a different thing. But, um, but if you want to write for an existing show and they're real fussy because you're being judged by the people that, like, say, there's an opening. 
one writer went to another, you know, series or something. So, you know, they read these things all day. You know, it's really hard to to make your episode, uh, you know, jump out. And uh, that's how to do it. Mm-hmm. it I mean, takes- if, if you do that, you, 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 they might not want to buy the episode. They might say, oh, we don't like the story or we did something like it. Um, our, you know, or we would never do that thing. But boy, can you write these characters? We'd like to have you come in and let's agree on a story. And uh, I can't emphasize, that would be the only thing I would do. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a lot of like, would you say natural talent as well? Like a natural knack for writing as well? Or yeah, Most people were like me, like they caused trouble in high school. Um, like my English teacher, oh, Mrs. Beck, now I can send her the link to this interview. Christine <laughs> Beck, she was my 11th grade English teacher. She said, if you shut up during class, I'll let you talk for the last five minutes. Because oh I would just make jokes. <laughs> she goes, well, you, I'll, I'll do that. And I said, okay. And I've kept in touch with her for 50, 50 years, 49 years. We write, write to each other. And, she, you know, to, to this day, we're, That's amazing. we're on Facebook yeah. together. But but uh, and and that's another thing uh, I would do would be encourage people. Um, if you have thirty students in a class, teachers are my heroes. By the way, mm-hmm. if you have thirty students in a class, you don't never know like which one. Some quiet guy in the back is he, he's either going to be a mass killer, or or maybe <laughs> he's like this phenomenal scientist or or some you know musician. Yeah, you never know. You don't know. But uh, usually, like, George Carlin was the class clown. Usually, if you ask any comedian, they were the class clown. Yeah, yeah. They made all the jokes and they got just, in trouble. They were annoying. People couldn't stand them, but they might be funny. And, and um, so she, she was very encouraging to me. That's great. You, know, you encourage, need somebody like You know, that. the thing with the arts... It's such a hard life, and people, you know, you can get put down a lot, usually by people that just don't have the guts to go for it themselves, mm-hmm. you know. And then when you fail or when you're struggling, they go, oh, that's, you know. And then when you're doing well, you get all these friends. Right, right. <laughs> and, and at first, it's like, oh, I've been accepted. And then you realize, no, I haven't. I just, like, they... <laughs> They're like fake friends, like fair you get, weather yeah. friends. You get a lot of that. You get a lot of that in Hollywood too. Yeah, it's like you you latch on if if you have a something that bombed, you know. And and I've come to realize I actually at one point I'm embarrassed to say like in my 30s mm-hmm. I used to think like what I did was just so important, and I'm like, and then Norman Lear told me, and we've been friends for 40 years now. He's 101, and you know, he said, it's just television. He goes, it's a TV show. And this is a guy that got honored at the Kennedy Center. Mm-hmm. Like he's got statues. You know, they named this school at USC after him, you know, the yeah. Lear Center. And he says, it's, and Alfred Hitchcock said the same thing. An actor said, I'm having a problem with this scene. He goes, "What? What is my motivation here? What am I? Why am I doing this?" And he goes, "I don't know. It's a movie." <laughs> That's hilarious. I always go like, <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock and Norman Lear, you know, says this. Then, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's you're not curing cancer. You're not uh, working as an EMT, mm-hmm. showing up someone's house at three in the morning to save their life. Uh, or like I said, my heroes are teachers, mm-hmm. but nurses. My daughter-in-law is a surgical nurse. Um, okay. You know, somehow I think that's like more important. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny. It's it's very humble, um, and but it is important in a way, making people laugh, making people. Um, it is. Make I had, their I, days. I had a friend um, named, um, what's his name? Al Canner. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, I used to write jokes. He wrote jokes for Johnny Carson, for Bob Hope and all that. And he saved them. And I have this picture. It's like this huge, it's like 
10 feet of jokes, just like like all stacks. I think he, I think now they're now in the Smithsonian. Whoa. He, he goes, because <laughs> Bob Hope would go and entertain the troops, you know, during the various wars. And, and um, he said, yeah, they're probably like, you know, 250,000 jokes. I go. That's my that's my con- contribution to the world. A lifetime of jokes, a right lifetime there. Lifetime of one-liners. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So that that is uh, my life in a nutshell. Mm-hmm. I'm I, I'm trying to think. I've had some huge sales. I've I had a million dollar sale of a spec script about a woman who is looking for um, Prince Charming, and she's almost 40, this is like back in 1992, mm-hmm. and uh, called First Comes Love, and she says, you know, I, I can't, she, she goes to a sperm bank, gets pregnant, and it turns out that the, her baby gets kidnapped because the sperm donor was a sultan, and he had made sperm deposits in case of, for assassination insurance okay. so that a male could overtake his kingdom from this little country so she goes off looking for her kid and meets him and they fall in love. And that's why it was called First Comes Love. So I love that. Uh, that is a great, it was actually, a, a, they did not make it. They almost made it. I was going to say, where can we find this? Because uh, I think I want to see that. <laughs> maybe, maybe they will. I worked, I did a, an adaptation of a book for Jimmy Buffett called Where is Joe Merchant? About, he wrote a novel, a very good novel. For, you think Jimmy Buffett, who just passed away. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's about a woman who, who has a brother like Elvis Presley, you know, he died, but nobody's found them. So there's sightings. So they go off looking for him with, and that's like the craziest job I had as far as the char- characters in the book, but I got to hang out with Jimmy Buffett for the day. Oh, so that's, that's a lot of people's dream. That, that <laughs> was, I wrote a, I wrote a, a script for a touchstone about, a. a also in the early 90s ab- about a virus a small company that creates and spreads a virus so that they can market the cure because they know how they created it so they have the vaccine and now look 30 years later and they're they, very uh relevant maybe a uh, conspiracy theories out right. there <laughs> so you know i did that and um a lot of a lot of what I call one and done. They call you in to do an episode of a show, and you do that, and, and that's it. Um, but the, but they're fun, and when you're in the audience, if you get the chance to um, to have something done, they you stand up and they go. The episode is written by you know. And everybody go, oh, there's, you know. Yeah, so like in the live studio audience, yeah, yeah, you get to experience that, but not so much. They don't show that on TV. Yeah. And, you, and you're working on some things right now as well, correct? You're still writing and... Yeah, so with the advent of the internet uh, and digital technology and the fact that uh, there are platforms where you can literally take your phone and put something up in front of the world like instantly. Um, that's helped a lot of people, a lot of writers and, and actors um, that have gotten older. And that's another thing. Um, when you get older, and old in Hollywood means over 40. Mm. In fact, and people will say, oh, that's not true. Yeah, it's true. All the unions have an over 40 uh, group to address the issue of being over 40. It's like, so, a, like a help group. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like you know, advice on how to get work. Because they think that the younger you are, the more relevant you are to mm. the audience. And maybe they're right. So that's why Norman hired young people and put, them, put us together with you know, older writers. And on The Tonight Show, we had uh, a fantasy wish list, a guest list of... You know, people we'd like to have on the show, dead or alive, like, well, we'd like to have Princess Diana. Well, she's never going to come on the show, <laughs> right? Or we'd like to have Napoleon or William <laughs> Shakespeare. Like, why stop? And, right. and we, we, you know, what questions we would ask them. And I came up with this idea. Um, I've, I've had it for a long time. 
called Over My Dead Body, where you just go to a cemetery of a famous rich, a rich person, a famous um, celebrity. Call it? Celebrity. Yeah. And uh, plug a mic into the headstone. This is the mic we use. Here's my, here's my prop mic. And we turn on this little speaker, and that's where the voice comes from. And we use voiceover actors, and we interview people like uh, Mark Twain and Richard Nixon and Phyllis Diller and Julia Child, and um, which you hosted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kristen was a host. Yes, it was awesome. <laughs> and, you know, we did Robert Kardashian, Nostradamus, um, Howard Cosell. We're going to do the fake news episode with Walter Cronkite. Nice. And I found that. Um, a lot of younger people didn't even know who who these people were. They had never heard of Jackie Gleason or Groucho Marx or Mae West. We did a good Mae West one. And so Amazon, Amazon Prime, just, um, they listed it as education as well as comedy because, you know, we spend about a third of the episode explaining to people who, you know, who it is. And... It's done very well. It, yeah. it, it has, people have said, oh, I didn't know, even people that knew the, uh, you know, the subjects of our, our episodes, they said, I didn't know, you know, Mae West was the wealthiest woman in the country and saved Paramount Pictures. I didn't know Steve Jobs didn't invent the iPhone or actually anything. Mm -hmm. He would take, what he did was he would take inventions or things that were already in existence and his designer, Johnny Ive, would make the um, make them look cool, like put a dial on, uh, you know, so you could, you know, tune in on music that way. Yeah. Or the or the the touch. What do you call that? The touch, touch screen. screen. Yeah. Um, and just make it like the experience when you take a, like an Apple product out, you open the box and it would kind of snap open a little. And, yeah. And the click that you get. That Very was all, exciting. All his, <laughs> all his idea, he wanted to make, you know, he, he said that people go to a gas station, they buy a product because they need it. He said with Apple, they buy the product because they want it. Mm -hmm. And he said he wanted to make this incredibly desirable product. It didn't even have to be better than other products. Yeah. And um, that doesn't sound funny, but that's... You know, some some of the things people said, I, I I had no idea. I thought he was the greatest inventor in the world. Yeah, it really is. If you watch it, it's really a great show over my dead body. And and you do you well, you get really good voice actors. That's like the, the Julia main... Child, I was like, wow, that is well, spot we, on. We we found <laughs> actors um, that regularly get work as these these characters. And you know, one we did Phyllis Diller. Sound just like Phyllis Diller. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people didn't know she was the first stand-up comic. She was 38 years old. She had five kids, and she just said, my husband's not making a living. I have to do something. <laughs> so she went out and, and auditioned and just talked about how her husband does nothing. And, and, and you know, became a comedy legend. And so, I, you know, I have this thing where I, I call it a universal theme. Everybody was death, I guess, but, but comedy about death, not, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, unlimited guests and a talk show everybody can relate to. And we, have, we put in a lot of uh, stills and, uh, and video clips. We have people call in and yell at them if they don't like them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're dead. You can say anything to them. Right, right. And it, it's really, it really was spawned from The Tonight Show and our idea of, like, you know, we're tired of booking the same guests. Like, wouldn't it be great? Yeah. You know, if, you know we get Van Morrison. They wanted, who do they want? They wanted, well, Elvis was one of them. Sure, yeah. You know. Well, maybe you can do one on Jimmy Buffett now. Yeah, we can. <laughs> so that, you know, that's how that... Um, that got started, and so I find in, in the act three of my life here, my career, 
a, a project that I enjoy doing that I could really do forever. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to do the Oscars called the Hollywood Lifetime Achievement Awards, where we have, you know, you know, all 90, right now it's up to 95 best pictures, 95 best actors, uh, people that won, and we're going to choose seven of those and then have one grand best actor, one grand best director, and uh, of, of all the past, you know, of all the past winners. So that's okay. a lot of a lot of uh, competition between like Forest Lawn and Westwood Memorial Park. and mm. Is and that all. the first time they've done something like that? Or? It's never been done. Wow. So is that this fact, year? We or have the Oscar right here. Okay. And the Oscar yeah, goes so to? It's been modified a little bit with wings. <laughs> and that is, that is our uh, Over My, you're seeing it first, the Over My Dead Body Award. And... Uh, and we have presenters, like we'll have Don Rickles is going to do an in-memoriam segment. But since everybody on the show is dead, he's going to do one featuring live actors whose careers are dead. Mm-hmm. Might, might as well be dead. Yeah. <laughs> so he'll probably do is, uh, Bill Cosby, funny. Harvey Weinstein will probably Oh, have, my gosh, that's hilarious. That. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we'll cut to the audience, and you'll see Clint Eastwood and Jack Nicholson and the usual... Reese Witherspoon, the usual people cheering. Um, so I have a rundown done on that. We're going to do that next year. In fact, you'll probably be one of the hosts, but you don't know it yet. Okay. Marking yeah. it down in my brain calendar. I have to do that. <laughs> and um, that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think what the writers go. I have seen a number of these interviews. And right now, probably it's being watched by a bunch of writers that have, you know, have been in the union a while going, gee, well, that, could, that was an interesting way to get into the business thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, I wish I had a hard in fact, I have a, a note here because they did instruct me to make sure To give advice. Yes. I've, I've given the advice. Oh, well, there's one other little, one other little tidbit. Um, you have to move to where the business is. And this is a, I've gotten resistance on this from people um, because they're scared. They don't want to live. They're, they're, they're all set up mm-hmm. where they live. You know, I'm not going to go 3,000 miles away to California. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, it's very competitive. And so if you want to be a country singer, you have to go to Nashville. Mm-hmm. If you want to be on Broadway, uh, you know, Broadway is, you know, is not in Kentucky. Right, right. And, you know, I wrote, I didn't do that. I wrote letters and this was my plan. I would write letters and I would make exploratory trips because I couldn't afford to move to California. Uh, but I did go out to California to to meet people. Norman wasn't the only one that I met. Okay. It was the last one I met. And I was on my way to the airport. I was going to be at the airport in four hours and that was it. And you I thought you no weren't going to go back or you weren't sure? Uh, well, I, you know... From between March 16th, which was a Wednesday, 1983, at 3 p.m. when he hired me, kind of stuck in my head, mm-hmm. until May 10th when my son was born. When, when am I going to come back? I, I, I knew that this was it. You're like, it's almost I mean, like your I, one not, shot kind of. I'm not saying I wouldn't come back. It was actually the second trip I made to California. I had made one once before, and I wrote letters. I made the calls and nobody answered. Nobody got back. Or when they did get, oh, he's out of town. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mm. tell you. And I, I'm like an idiot. I'm out, you know, staying at the Holiday Inn, which thankfully I had a friend that managed it. And I think he gave me a room for like 40 bucks a night. Oh, nice, nice. You know? And I, when I got back in February, I said, if I have to go back. We have to go back. And, and I, you know, and my wife said, okay. All right, and we we went back, and I just uh, you know I didn't move there, but I went there twice, 
and 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 then move, obviously move there. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that is it right right now. Like this is being recorded in Philadelphia, in this lovely studio. Uh, with you and with the wonderful director Tim Milloway, <laughs> and um, th- what a great place to get experience! If yes. I if I wanted to get into TV right now, knowing what I know or movies, um, I would learn as much as I can. Uh, you know, watch them, read scripts. Don't really read books about scripts. That okay. me- that messes up your mind. Uh, because then you're analyzing the script and what's missing, and you're so you're so busy analyzing it that that like oh I have to put my plot point here and this guy I've got to come you know, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's like and you end up with this paint by numbers thing it doesn't feel it feels manufactured it's like overcomplicating it it's easier to just write it and then kind of kick it into shape afterwards okay but if you're if if this thing is too well laid out. It's just going to be your drive yourself nuts, you know. And so I would, I would look at the the movies. I would turn the turn the volume off and study just how that you know mm-hmm. tell the story visually uh, or on TV. Just listen to the audio, write a few scripts. The very first draft of the thing you write is not your best. <laughs> You're not ready to, you're, rough not, draft. you're not ready to get creative artists representing you and 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 the network uh, giving you a, a series order. You are not mm-hmm. you must you must uh, really enjoy writing. I can't believe I'm saying that cuz I can't even stand it. Some, no? some well sometimes it's like, <laughs> you know, like I, I don't know anybody that goes, "God, I just can't wait to sit down and write." Yeah. You know, it's like they're like, "God, I'm glad that's done." <laughs> you know, it's like giving blood, really. Oh it's like, oh, I can't wait. When, when, how soon can you get me on that list earlier to give a blood donation? So, so I, I would do that, and I would, and I would join the community. If it's a, if you're an actor, a community theater, I would join a, a community access media and take the classes mm-hmm. and and practice. Um, and get yourself in as good a shape as possible. And the main thing, everything I say is the main thing. Um, <laughs> the main thing is, what do you want to do and who does what you want to do? Mm, and narrowing it down, them. yeah. What did you do? What do I got to do to be you? I, you're the person that, I think that's what I put in the letter. Not not in those words, but. Yeah. That's the point. What do you want to, like. You're exactly who I want to be, so, you know, and some of them, might, they might laugh and go, well, you don't want to be me. You know, I said, I'm just, you know, and it's a flattering thing. And it's also, you know, it's true. And you say, and just find out what they did. And I'm going to tell you right now, they all have, all have the same story. They just did as best they could, and they went there, mm-hmm. you know, and they went, and, and then the other, another secret, Arthur Penn, who directed Bonnie and Clyde, he said, oh, there's only one secret to making it in show business. What's that? Never give up. Yes. Never give up. You give up, like a, my, my friend that worked for 40 years and ended up starring in Funny Girl last year, Debbie Cardona from NYU. And um, she, didn't she didn't give up. This is like, she's like, ha- I, I, she like, look up the word happy in the dictionary and you will see her picture. So that, you know, set yourself up. You're very lucky to have community access um, theater. Mm-hmm. No uh, matter where you are, you, you can likely find. What, what you're find doing it, yeah. in, in theater and, mm-hmm. and in singing and we didn't talk about you. No, no, it's okay. not about me. <laughs> Is exactly what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't put yourself out there. You have to just, you know, and you practice and you learn. And um, somebody watching this in another state, uh, they they can start there. Everybody started there. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I know, you know, a handful of people that are just from LA, and so it was easier for them in that they're in LA. But um, 
this, the, you know, this the same thing. They started in some radio station or yeah, part of it's luck, but not much of it's luck. Mm-hmm. Luck, luck is when you make a hundred call. Luck is when you make your first call and you get hired. Yeah. Okay. Like, like I guess that would be luck. Yeah, that would be. But, luck. but I don't know that to be the case, like ever. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know an exception. To Forty-one years in the Writers Guild, and I, you know, I, I don't know of any exception. People just wrote and and tried to be authentic. Don't try to imitate another writer. Like, don't be Hemingway. He does that really well. Right, right. You know, every, everybody has has their own unique voice. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for this interview. And I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did, uh, learning about Steve's life and his uh, contribution to uh, screen and TV. 